Hi everyone, thank you for joining us and welcome to Environmental Health Australia's live chat event to celebrate Food Safety Week 2021. My name is Melissa Byrne and I'm the National Vice President of EHA and it is my pleasure to host our second Food Safety Week national event. This year is the 25th anniversary of Australian Food Safety Week and the theme this year is Food Safety, Be Prepared. This theme is aimed at building resilience in community, especially after disasters, by setting up a basic food safety toolbox and encouraging public engagement with food safety courses. Today we will be hearing from some fantastic environmental health and food safety professionals. We will open up for questions for five minutes after each speaker's presentation. To ask a speaker a question, simply type a comment below. You are welcome to comment at any time and questions will be answered at the end of a speaker's presentation. Our first speaker is joining us all the way from America. Amber Potts is the Senior Project Coordinator in Food Safety for the National Environmental Health Association. And today she will be sharing with us some of US food safety programs for emergencies. Welcome, Amber. I'm muted. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. Um, yeah, my name is Amber Potts and I'll begin my presentation now. Greetings colleagues. My name is Amber Potts and I'm a senior project coordinator for food safety at the National Environmental Health Association or NEHA for short. NEHA represents more than 6,600 governmental and private sector environmental health professionals in the United States, its territories, and through its members in active uniform service around the globe. NEHA is the profession's strongest advocate for excellence in the practice of environmental health as it delivers on its mission to build, sustain, and empower an effective environmental health workforce. I am pleased to have been invited to speak to you all. On behalf of NEHA, I want to take a moment to thank you, the environmental health workforce, for your continued hard work, resiliency, and commitment to protect public health. As environmental health professionals, we need to be prepared to keep the food supply safe during emergencies. Just as our public health partners have a plan to deliver vaccines during emergencies, environmental health professionals must have a plan to deliver their food safety programs during emergencies. As we consider how to plan alternative ways to operate our food safety programs, we need to ask ourselves the question, what will we do if? Regulatory food safety programs are guided by ordinances, standard operating procedures, and protocols. Your agency likely has an emergency preparedness plan. Does it include food safety? If it does, was environmental health engaged in the development of that plan? Is environmental health part of your agency's incident command system or incident command management? Environmental health regulatory agencies should consider having a food safety program preparedness plan. As we have experienced over the past 20 months, food safety programs may not be able to function as expected in the event of a disaster or other emergency. Next, I will discuss a few food safety issues that may arise during an emergency that will present challenges to your food safety regulatory programs. How will your agency prepare in the event that your entire jurisdiction is impacted by a disaster, effectively causing a food establishment mass casualty? There is a need to develop a food establishment triage system that focuses on regulatory needs. One approach is to develop a system that mimics a human mass casualty event protocol by developing a tagging or naming system that assigns degrees of urgency to decide the order of treatment. Your agency would define this system based on resources available and on the extent of the disaster. Looking at the color tags on this slide, blue would be used to tag food establishments that are completely unaffected by the emergency, indicating that no agency resources are needed. Green tags would be used to identify food establishments that have suffered minor impacts and do not require immediate support and your agency should not respond until all establishments with more severe impacts have been addressed and your agency resources have been fully replenished. Yellow tags would be used for food establishments that have sustained enough damage that if your agency does not assist the establishment soon, it will likely pose a public health threat in the near future. 
Red tags are for food establishments whose continued operation causes a health hazard, and your agency must assist immediately to mitigate that health hazard. And finally, black tags are for those food establishments that have sustained damage so severe that their establishment cannot and will not operate for a defined amount of time, and therefore no agency assistance is required at the immediate time. Be prepared that all or almost all of your food establishments may have been affected during a major disaster. How will your agency prepare to conduct inspections when inspectors are unable to be physically present? Your preparedness plan should include alternative inspection protocol for when your inspectors cannot be physically present or when there are not enough resources to complete all required inspections. Here are a few ideas. Virtual inspections. Scheduled inspections between the inspector and the food establishment through a virtual platform such as FaceTime or Zoom. Recorded inspections. The food establishment video records themselves completing the inspection and then sends it to the inspector for review. Self-guided inspections. Food establishments take photos of their establishment and send those photos to the inspector for review. Records only inspections. The food establishment sends in requested records such as food safety certification, temperature logs, HACCP logs, etc. Lastly, an imminent health hazard only inspection. As discussed on the previous slide, you may identify food establishments that need immediate inspections due to the public health threat they pose if they continue to operate. Therefore, during times of limited agency resource availability, your agency could conduct imminent hazard only inspections with the purpose of mitigating those immediate threats. Your agency may identify other alternative inspections that best suit their needs. The intent here being to raise awareness that your agency may not be able to complete routine standardized inspections during emergencies and that preparation should be made for an alternative way to continue to deliver regulatory inspections and protect public health. How will your agency ensure food safety during food shortages due to a disaster? When the food supply is threatened, people will go to unimaginable lengths to feel food secure with no regard to food safety. During a winter storm here in the United States earlier this year, entire cities lost power, lost water, and had severe plumbing damage that caused interior flooding. Due to food contamination, food establishments had to discard large quantities of food at once. The general public, unaware of why the food was discarded, began taking and consuming the food they found in dumpsters and refuse containers. Your regulatory agency should prepare to mitigate food safety issues that may arise as food shortages can present unique challenges to your food safety programs. How will your agency ensure food safety during mass feedings? Mass feedings are likely during an extended emergency and food preparation could occur in residential homes, in licensed food establishments, or in unlicensed semi-commercial kitchens, as can be found in places of worship, community buildings, or clubhouses. Whether the food handlers are licensed in food safety or not, bulk food preparation may not be something they are familiar with. It would therefore be beneficial to prepare bulk food preparation guidance documents and public service announcements as part of your agency's food safety program preparedness plan. If restaurants are unable to serve dine-in customers, these restaurants may make every attempt to survive. Another food safety issue that arose here in the United States during the height of COVID this past year was that restaurants became grocery stores and manufacturing facilities as they needed to sell their inventory before it expired. They prepared meal kits, began using reduced oxygen packaging or other specialized processes, began selling raw ingredients and making and selling their own cleaning supplies all without identifying, evaluating, and controlling for any potential food safety hazards. The establishments were vacuum sealing all food items for ease of transport or extended shelf life. They were not properly labeling items and were repackaging bulk ingredients without the proper license. Your agency may consider collaborating with partner regulatory meat, seafood, or manufactured food agencies to develop a robust guidance document for your restaurants during emergencies. It is important that your agency prepare to address new potential health threats such as these and that you're able to guide your restaurants as they attempt to stay in business. How will your agency issue or renew licenses or collect fees when food establishments are unable to operate? During disasters, food establishments may be closed for an extended amount of time. 
emergency licensing and fee protocol should be established. If food establishments are not in operation due to a disaster, will you suspend license or late fees? Will you require license renewals even when the food establishment cannot open? Ensure your agency establishes emergency license and fee protocols as part of your food safety program preparedness plan. How will your agency respond to food establishments that reopen after extended closures? When a food establishment is closed for a significant amount of time and your inspectors are unable to conduct an inspection, the food establishment may not take the appropriate measures to ensure food safety before a reopening. Significant menu changes may have occurred. A food safety reopening guidance document could be developed as an industry resource. When agency resources are sufficient, a reopening inspection should occur. Your agency preparedness plan should include addressing these food safety issues. Environmental health regulatory agencies deliver food safety programs to protect public health. Food safety programs may face seemingly insurmountable challenges during major emergencies and disasters. Resources and time will be limited and alternative ways to ensure food safety must be planned in advance. It is my hope that what you have heard here today will aid your agency in preparing your food safety programs to effectively protect public health in the event of an emergency. The work you do every day is important and needed ever more so during emergencies. In the words of Maya Angelou, hoping for the best, prepared for the worst, and unsurprised by anything in between. Thank you. Thank you, Amber. The triage system for food businesses is a great template that can be applied to any country's emergency response, and it's a great way to utilize technology when resources are stretched during an emergency. We're now opening up for any questions. What are some benefits of virtual inspections? Um, I think a benefit of virtual inspections um, is that you can learn pretty quickly what your food managers do and do not know, especially when you're having them uh, do things for you, like calibrate their stem thermometer, check food temperatures. Um, it's a pretty quick way to learn uh, where areas you can improve their knowledge on. Um, and then another uh, benefit would be inspections can save time and resources, especially virtual inspections, especially if your establishment has a pretty good health record um, and virtual inspections are something you're able to do there. It can open up time and, and resources for other establishments that may need um, in-person inspections. Thank you. Did you find the good were good and the bad denied access? I'm um, not quite sure I understand the question. Um, do you mean it deny access to inspectors allowing in the food establishment? Um, if that was the case, I think um, the yes, the bad the bad places likely don't want you in there to begin with, and especially when they're um, establishment is already struggling and they may fear that you may potentially make it worse, especially if they're financially struggling. Um, so they were definitely more inclined for virtual inspections. Um, uh, so yes. Thank you for answering that. What are some ways to respond to food safety issues due to food shortages? I think if you develop warning signs uh, for dumpster containers or refuse containers that just informs the public that this food is not sound and not fit for consumption, maybe a really good way to let them know that. Um, as well as public service announcements following uh, social media, public social media can also give you some ideas. Great. What would be the new norms of food safety, health and hygiene after COVID-19? Uh, an increase in hand washing and sanitizing and disinfecting. Although the biggest challenge I see with the new um, wave of sanitizing and disinfecting is making sure they're doing it correctly. You want to make sure they're not um, incorrectly disinfecting food contact surfaces, potentially, you know, um, making someone sick due to chemicals. So. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Amber. I know it's quite quite late over there, um, so we won't hold you up any further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.
way. Bye. We will now be speaking with Tanya Morrison, National President of the New Zealand Institute of Environmental Health and an Environmental Health Officer in New Zealand for over 10 years. Her key areas of interest with environmental health include food safety, swimming pool water quality, noise control and the appearance industries. Thank you for joining us today, Tanya. It's always a pleasure to hear from my colleagues over the ditch. Thanks very much for having me, um, Melissa and the team. Um, it's great to uh, be, a chat, be, a part, be a part of your Facebook chat again. Um, so today um, I'm just going to run through a bit of a New Zealand perspective and take on food safety and being prepared around the, food, uh, the theme that this uh, live chat is all about today. Um, a little bit different here in New Zealand in terms of the, um, at least the regulatory environment that we're uh, working in as environmental health officers and food verifiers. Um, we talk a lot about in New Zealand food being simply safe and suitable. Um, and in actual fact, as you can see on the screen there, a picture of it, um, that's actually the name of our templated food safety management system, um, also known as a food control plan here in New Zealand. And this is the templated food safety management system that uh, the majority of our food service industry, basically all of our cafes and restaurants um, will use. Um, so that's a government issued uh, template plan. And this templated plan has been around uh, probably for over 10 years easily. Um, it was voluntary for a start and then it became law when our new food laws all changed back in March 2016 with the introduction of our new Food Act, the Food Act 2014. Um, so the new Food Act is all about risk management. So there's multiple tiers to the system in terms of types of food businesses um, and how often they have to be checked, as we say, verified here, a uh, fancy word for inspected basically. Um, and that's all based upon the concept of risk. So the less riskier you are as a business, for example, a coffee cart, uh, you don't get checked nearly as often as a large restaurant, for example. Um, and that risk management approach applies not only to the food industry, but the concept extends further to the general public as well. So some of the traditional activities around food, a uh, big one here in New Zealand is um, fundraising, for example, sausage sizzles. And I'm sure that's probably something that occurs in Australia as well. And, and generally you don't have to uh, go too far to a hardware store, the likes of a Bunnings throughout the country, and they try to lure you in with that lovely smell of the, of the barbecue and the sausage, trying to get that loose change out of your pocket as you exit the store. Um, but fundraising activities under their new Food Act here, um, they're actually an exempt activity as long as you, um, if, if you do it up to 20 times a year. So that's quite a new concept under the Food Act here, and it's all again based around risk. So it puts the onus heavily on people preparing food that they need to prepare, cook, handle the food safely, make sure that whatever food they put out is safe and suitable to eat. Um, so having that onus on the food operator or on the person behind the barbecue, for example, um, that again is just putting that ownership on that person that they have to get the food safety right. So that message again is targeted not just to the food businesses, but it's intended for everyone. So New Zealand Food Safety, uh, which is a branch of the Ministry for Primary Industries here in New Zealand, they've done a lot of work about promoting our new Food Act um, when it obviously the laws changed a few years ago. And one of the key target populations that they have done a lot of work with is our Maori and Pacific Island groups. So one, uh, one, one way they've done that is they put out some TV adverts, um, often screened on Maori television here in New Zealand, promoting basic food safety concepts, uh, along with targeted messages, for example, around cooking shellfish pro properly. The Maori and Pacific Island communities, they also often um, do large gatherings and share a lot of food, some of which could be foraged or otherwise collected, such as kai moana or seafood, um, for the likes of pawa or crayfish and other delicacies. There's also traditional ways of cooking um, in those cultures, for example, a hangi, uh, which is where your food is cooked in the ground for a long length of time. So the specific guidance around the marais and the traditional cooking methods uh, that's put out by the ministry is, is acknowledging that there's different ways to approach um, food safety um, and often compared to those mainstream methods that um, we probably think are often the only thing we really see, but there is more than one way to obviously cook and prepare food safely. So again, it comes back to this outcomes-focused approach 
Um, and there's many ways to reach that end point of safe and suitable food. And again, it's up to that individual uh, to put the ownership on them to achieve that end point and manage the risks along the way. So one of the pictures I've got here on the screen is um, some of the toolkits, um, promotional materials and guidance that the ministry puts out to our uh, Marais, for example. They give them some free uh, thermometers, some stickers and posters, all just trying to help promote um, basic food safety concepts. So traditionally here in New Zealand, there was a campaign that was around for many years called the Four Cs. Um, now, this is um, a picture of it here, and it's uh, just note it's the old logo for the New Zealand Food Safety. So this is um, uh, just a bit of a throwback to what used to be put out. They've obviously rebranded themselves now, but the, the concepts of the four Cs, the cook, clean, cover, chill, um, they still are arguably current in this uh, day and age. And they're quite simple food safety messages for everyone to understand whether you're in the food industry or not. So keeping our messages simple around food safety is often the key as well. So not getting too technical. So an example of that could be, for example, cook your meats thoroughly until the juices run clear. Now that's a much easier way to describe a safe cooking method for food than saying that you need to reach a minimum of 75 degrees internally. Because in all honesty, unless you probably work in the food industry as a chef, or maybe you're an environmental health officer, um, who actually has a probe thermometer in their home kitchen? There's not many people who do. Now, COVID, as we know, has thrown us many challenges in the past couple of years. And we know that not just here in New Zealand, but worldwide, an industry that's been hit really hard by the lockdowns and other restrictions is our hospitality and food service industries. So when snap lockdowns are called, for example, and that happened here in New Zealand back in the middle of August for us, um, all of a sudden, your businesses have to react quickly to save or otherwise do something, often with a large volume of food. So that could mean freezing it down or repurposing or storing it, um, but often that food needs to be given away to staff, family, friends, donated, or just disposed of as lockdown creates that unknown problem. We don't know how long we're going to be in lockdown, so chances are you can't keep it, um, or you, you're unsure about whether it's going to be safe and suitable for a future use. So consider at the moment here in New Zealand, um, the majority of our country is all in alert level two of our four alert levels for COVID. Uh, so for alert level two, that means, for example, restaurants, all our service is table seated. Now that may not really direct food safety or availability directly, but shared foods such as buffets, for example, have had a lot of questions raised around them in COVID times. Other parts of New Zealand at the moment are still in alert level three, which is effectively lockdown with McDonald's is kind of the running joke. Um, but what it means is contactless food preparation, pickup and deliveries. So without a dine-in component, customers can't go into a cafe or restaurant. They can order online or by phone or by text and basically have to pick it up in a contactless way at the door. And if it's not picked up at the door, um, there's also other ways such as Uber Eats, or I guess the Australian equivalent is um, Deliveroo. I think that's one of them. Um, and they've seen an enormous spike in popularity due to lockdown and COVID, this contactless method of getting food. So, you know, there's a few food safety concerns um, there as well with these delivery services. Can they keep hot food hot and cold food cold? Um, you know, any requests around allergen meals or ensuring a timely delivery to um, make sure the food reaches its destination uh, and it's fit for purpose. So you can quickly see that the way that we order and consume our food has changed in a big way in a short amount of time. Currently in New Zealand, there's another wee issue on the rise, and that is actually our food banks in New Zealand are in dire need at the moment, uh, running very low on stock. And this, I think, is also a bit of a reflection of the current climate, not just because of COVID, and obviously we know times are tough out there for a lot of people, and the demand for food aid is very high. But what we also need to consider here is that we're dealing with food businesses, for example, who often donate a lot of food to food banks or to food share organisations and making sure that that food is also safe and suitable to be consumed. So the times are tough for businesses as well, um, so much so that you, you may start seeing businesses pushing the limits on food storage of some items to avoid the extra cost of purchasing more food or having to waste food. Um, and that's something I think as food verifiers and inspectors, we just need to be aware of that. Unfortunately, when times are tough and money is tight, uh, the odd corner can start to be cut a little. Um, so sometimes you see them cutting back on staff hours to save on paying people to do cleaning. Sometimes you just try to push those shelf life a little bit uh, further to keep that food as long as you can. So 
It's not ideal, but it can have an impact on food safety, so it's something to be aware of. And as we head into the festive season and hopefully some warmer weather um, here in New Zealand and Australia in summer at least, um, outdoor events in particular are likely going to increase in popularity. So again, with current COVID restrictions here in New Zealand, some places of the country there's higher amounts of people can gather outside than they can inside at the moment. So we might see more barbecue style foods offered or at least a change in how and where food is cooked, stored, prepared or otherwise served to accommodate more people. So in terms of preparedness and especially in this current day and age, we know that information is key to help people stay safe and that includes with their food. Food recalls seem to be becoming more and more prevalent, not just here, but all around the world. And a recent example of this, uh, literally in the last week or so, there was a large sugar recall um, that happened here. It was actually due to an ingredient with molasses that were potentially contaminated by lead. So the message of the recall for the sugar varieties was do not consume due to the potential uh, for lead to be present. And ultimately that led to a second recall for licorice, uh, where the same molasses were actually used. Um, now, this only affected selected brands and products, um, and albeit across a few different brands, but unless you subscribe to the Ministry's food recall notifications, um, or you happen to see a food recall notice at a point of sale, um, given that these were consumer level recalls, how else would you know not to consume this product? So product, re product recalls are often seen for foreign object concerns more and more, um, also undeclared allergens or trace allergens being present. If anyone out there does have a food um, allergy or intolerance, I would strongly advise you, if you're not already, just to subscribe to the ministry's websites or uh, for Zan's Food Standards Australia New Zealand is another good one um, to receive those recall notifications via their websites. Um, it's actually quite interesting when you tune into it, the volume of recalls um, that's happening and obviously what the types of recalls are and how often they actually do occur. And um, as you can also see there with information being key, this is just another example on the screen of a simple food safety message about the danger zone. Um, and for us, obviously, as, as uh, environmental health professionals as well, we know a lot about this in terms of keeping hot food hot, cold food cold. Warm food is never good. Um, certainly if there's an outdoor gathering and you want to invite a health officer along and we think that that creamy potato salad's been sitting out there all day, we're probably the worst people you could ever invite to, um, to a shared food gathering or arguably the best. It's up to you to decide, I guess. So the long and the short of it is when it comes to food safety and being prepared, let's keep it simple. Um, you know, you can have a lot of mixed messages out there, um, a lot of ways in terms of how to reach the outcomes, but often it's the direct approach that's actually the most effective. An example of that is what I've mentioned earlier with the four C's. It's a bit of a timeless message, the cook, clean, cover, chill, um, but they are timeless in the fact that it's easy to understand and it's easy to remember. So whilst as uh, environmental health officers and food verifiers, we do have a regulatory role um, in what we do and we're checking our food businesses. But we also have an opportunity to guide and mentor people that we deal with um, on a day-to-day -day basis and encourage them to do the right thing with their food safety practices and maintain those practices to a high standard, to be champions in their field and to lead the way. And hopefully if we do our jobs properly with that, that message will filter through, um, not just into the food businesses we deal with, but their staff and their food safety culture will improve and they'll want to do the right thing because they should, not because they're getting checked up on and, and being told to otherwise and hopefully that message will filter through even to the general public as well. It only takes one complaint, as we know, to sink a business for good. Uh, the old good news travels a lot slower than bad news is actually true, but it's the good news of word of mouth that you want, not that one uh, poor um, experience that can lead to catastrophic consequences in a health respect or, or also for your business. So that old adage of we worry so you don't have to as environmental health officers and, and health inspectors, I guess, rings true once again within our profession. We try to help uh, people become as prepared as they can, manage the risks around food safety the best they can. And again, hopefully that uh, message will sift through. And of course, if all else fails, we come back to, especially here in New Zealand, our little catchphrase for food safety is ask yourself the question of the two S's. Is it safe and is it suitable? And if you can answer those two questions with a couple of ticks, the majority of the time we'll all be saying bon appétit. Um, thank you very much. I'm happy to take some questions now, uh, if there's any questions coming in. Thank you, Tanya. 
in Australia, you can now get your sausage and a COVID vaccine from Bunnings. <laughs> That's and I love awesome. The work, yeah, <laughs> I love the work that you've done with your Maori community as well, considering all the different ways that you can make safe the food cooked and safely and suitably. So I'll open up for questions for Tanya. Okay, the first question in New Zealand, do Maoris have to register under the Food Act? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, in, in short, the Marais, um, no, they don't have to register unless they're offering food for commercial reasons. Um, so, for example, holding functions or um, outside catering for guests. So um, if they're doing those activities, then they should have a licence and they would be checked under the Food Act. Um, and they're probably using the templated food control plan or the Mari version food control plan. But if it's all just for their own members um, in terms of traditional food for their own um, whānau and communities, um, then no, they wouldn't need to be registered. Thank you. Are there any limits on food that can be donated by businesses in New Zealand to the likes of food banks? Um, no, there isn't. Um, there's a few things that I guess are a little bit frowned upon. And, and to be honest, this is probably dictated more by the food banks themselves in terms of what they will and won't accept. Um, so, for example, they're not likely to, a lot of food banks won't accept uh, from food businesses, you know, that the ham sandwich or the sushi that's been around all day. They'll go for more of the baked items like bread or cake or muffins um, or, you know, any dry goods, for example, that have definitely got a lower risk. Um, and that just means that they lower their risk when they receive the food to handle it, but also then it's easier to store and easier to turn around. Um, so strictly speaking, you just use a bit of common sense about uh, the lower the risk, the easier it is to pass that food on. Yep. Have you seen a change in cases after the advertising campaign? So by cases, I'm wondering if you mean food poisoning cases? Um, mm. Um, it's a wee bit hard to tell in terms of a campaign is run to actually have the, the data before a campaign starts and then compare it to afterwards um, because there's always a little bit more to it than just looking at the numbers and being able to attribute a campaign as being um, uh, effective or not effective, I guess, in that respect. Um, generally speaking, numbers maintained for food poisoning outbreaks in here in New Zealand are relatively constant. We don't really see massive spikes um, too often. Um, if, you know, you'd see a more, more likely like a norovirus spike than you would say like a compilobacter or a huge outbreak due to food safety concerns. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. What are some guidelines for hungi? For hungi, right. So, uh, so those who are not really aware, hungi in really, really simple terms is... Um, you, you basically have, uh, I guess, for lack of a better phrase, a bit of a bonfire, so a fire scenario, and then you dig up the ground. The ground's really hot. Your food's really well wrapped um, and basically buried in the ground, and it kind of slow cooks within the hot earth uh, for long lengths of time. So guidelines, actually, though, the cooking method as described traditionally, that's how it happens. Your food is actually in the ground cooking. Um, when it comes up, and that's often the experience of um, operators knowing that it needs to be in there for some length of time, and we're usually talking hours, like could be four, five, six hours minimum. Um, you can still actually temperature check your food when it comes out. Or if you don't have thermometers, you can actually check your meat, your juices are running clear. You can usually tell by the colour of your vegetables and things like that as well. So um, the guidelines are all part of that Mariah Food Safety Program and it gives the options. Um, so again, multiple ways to, to check it, to control it, as long as the end point of safe food, thoroughly cooked food is reached that's kind of the guidelines in a nutshell. So it doesn't stop people doing it. It just means the outcome has to still be met. Yep, thank you. All right, good. there's no further questions. So thank you so much for your time this afternoon. No worries, always a pleasure. Thanks guys. Thank you. We're now joined by Lydia Butchman from the Food Safety Information Council. Lydia was a founding member of the Food Safety Information Council and has been involved in its communication work since 1997. She has also headed the communication and stakeholder engagement section of Food Standards Australia New Zealand for ZANS from 1997 to 2010 and was their representative on the FSIC executive during that period. Hi Lydia and thank you for joining our live chat today. Yeah. 
Hi, thank you and uh, happy Food Safety Week everybody. Um, yes, welcome to Food Safety Week. We've certainly been busy and ironically I've just been stuck on the phone with a lady whose power's gone out and um, didn't know what to do with everything in her fridge, but we went through it all jar by jar. It was fun. Yes. Just to start out, just a little bit about us as the Food Safety Information Council. We um, were founded back in 1997 and in fact this is the 25th Food Safety Week, so it's been going quite a long time. And really as the new food laws came in in Australia, we were quite keen that um, someone kept an eye on what happened between um, people purchasing that food and uh, and consuming it. So however well all the regulators were doing, um, it was very important to get it right for the consumers as well. No good if they're putting their shopping in a hot car and uh, driving off to the kids' soccer before uh, taking it home several hours later. That won't help reduce the cases of food poisoning in Australia. Uh, so we run Food Safety Week every November, followed by a summer campaign as well. Um, and each month we do a, a different campaign for consumers, whether it's death cap, death cap mushrooms or food safety, uh, lunchbox safety at schools and all sorts of things. Um, and we kick off uh, with uh, food safety at community service announcements on TV and radio all uh, over the summer. Videos in doctor surgeries, lots of social media and um, posters out there. And we also run a separate food safety campaign for First Nations. So our aim is to reduce the estimated 4.1 million cases of food poisoning in Australia. Um, that's similar to most Western countries, but it still results in an awful lot of hospitalizations and deaths a year. And is a big strain on the health system. A lot of visits to the doctor, a lot of prescriptions for antibiotics unnecessarily, and a lot of, uh, of uh, days lost uh, in work. So, um, quite important work that we do do. Um, our consumer research, which we've been doing for the full um, 25 years, um, uh, show some pretty hor horrific <laughs> uh, statistics here. 17% um, of the Aussies still don't wash their hands after going to the toilet. 20% don't wash their hands before handling food. That's from last year. Um, and in fact, we measured uh, hand washing from the COVID time in 2020 uh, to this year. And in fact, there was a 15% drop in hand washing since last year. We think as people get a little bit more complacent. Um, overall, men's food safety knowledge is worse than women's. Younger people's knowledge is worse than older's Australian. And surprisingly, university educated people are, have poorer knowledge than people with just a high school education. We think that's because they're less likely to do something like um, home economics. Um, we're really not quite sure about that, but a similar thing has shown up in the US too, I understand. Uh, and a lot of people are at risk out there. 35% uh, of Aussie households say they have someone in them in that high risk, vulnerable group, so elderly, pregnant, or someone with immune problems. 25% um, of Aussies still like eating raw or minimally cooked eggs, which is quite a risk. And uh, yeah, like New Zealand, 75% of um, Australians don't have a meat thermometer at home, but um, we're working on changing that. So this week, uh, this year, Food Safety Week uh, is Be Prepared. Um, we're focusing on getting people to build up a food safety toolbox. And um, I take the point in New Zealand that uh, people really don't have thermometers. We're tr really trying to encourage people to pick them up, um, to get a fridge thermometer for their fridge to make sure it's running uh, under five degrees Celsius, to actually use a meat thermometer if they do have one to get it out of their drawer and use it. And finally, to take a food safety course, we keep explaining to people um, what they should do, but not why. So there's some really good courses out there that have been set up by uh, by local governments, state and territory governments here. And also we partner with First for Training, who do a really nice learning management system and a whole range of courses that take you up to quite a high level. Uh, I did test it out and I did pass, luckily. It's a bit of a worry at one stage, uh, but that's a really easy, easy one to use. Uh, so uh, we've just kicked off our national radio and TV community service announcements, which you can see on our website. They'll run to the end of January. And for our uh, First Nations campaign in Australia, we use an Aboriginal elder called Johnsy. Uh, he comes from Central Australia uh, and uh, he runs it on Indigenous radio throughout the country, uh, getting food safety messages out there that are meaningful for our uh, Indigenous communities. 
so certainly that focus on uh, being prepared for emergencies is really important. Um, natural disasters are increasing. Uh, they don't just affect the immediate area. So if there's a bushfire or a storm or a flood, it can cut power to a wider region than the area affected. Um, the information, consumer information is based on a great uh, Western Australian campaign that they uh, state government put together and we circulated for with input from all the other jurisdictions as well um, and it links in with local food safety and emergency information too so we become uh, when of course there is an emergency we're a central source of info for the public people google us we have some very good google ads that point towards our website um, we do a lot of media on this in fact um, abc emergency which is our emergency radio station um, has pre-recorded interviews so as the natural disasters happen they can actually uh, run our interviews talking about uh, what to do during an emergency so essentially those messages are stock up with long life foods, um, keep a, a, a good supply of those, enough food for um, oh, your pets and kids as well, uh, check your medication, uh, keep a radio going, uh, a battery powered radio, so even if the power's out you can listen to what's happening. Right down to how to store uh, water if you haven't got access to drinking water, uh, have to have, have a barbecue so you can still keep cooking, and how to, uh, you know, throw out any food that isn't required is in safe and uh, how if you've got a large amount how to work with your local council to get it picked up um, in floods of course there's uh, problems with contamination after flood um, especially of drinking water and uh, food that's been in contact with the flood um, my colleagues in the Northern Territory got caught once uh, to get, trying to get people to throw out the beer that she thought was being contaminated by flood water. She said that got a bit tense up in the Northern Territory. Um, but uh, certainly some other advice on um, all, including your fruit and veggies growing in your garden. And of course, that simple message, if in doubt, throw it out. Um, the power outage one is very hard because you've got this time temperature control um, and you know messages like to take the high risk foods out and put them in the freezer for a while that helps uh, move it to someone else is not affected by a power cut if that helps and once again to throw it out if it's unsafe uh, the additional one for bush, bushfires is the smoke and dangerous fumes that can affect food and also the firefighting toxic chemicals there um, and drinking water as well is a real problem during bushfires so we'd like to do more. We've applied to the Australian government for a number of grants to help for being prepared for food safety and natural disasters. We'd really like to develop a, an app that people can use when they're offline and don't necessarily have access um, to, to the internet. And so they can look up advice. Certainly we've modelled it on the Red Cross um, one, which also works offline during emergencies. Uh, we want to get people to um, stock up using a pantry list of essential long life items. Uh, and we want to uh, advertise all of this by run, running another communication campaign about it. Um, and we're really keen that people uh, actually get that cooking and meat thermometer because that's so essential to uh, check that food is safe. So we'd love more um, local government involved. We have all the states and territories uh, as members, um, Food Standards Australia, New Zealand, um, CSIRO. Um, the only people who aren't involved are Victoria. They've pulled out recently, uh, possibly because they're very busy. We'd like them back in the fold if anyone has some influence there. But we still get our info out to, um, to Victorians, of course, there because it's a, a large population. Um, so if you'd like to join in the fun, um, you can uh, become a member at any stage. It doesn't cost much if you're a local council. Um, suggest some ideas for an education campaign. We're really keen to know something that may come up that you'd like to focus on, whether it's you know, death cat mushrooms or um, something that's come up quite recently, and I don't know if this is happening overseas, is illegal sales of... Um, of food on Facebook Marketplace. So these are unregistered food premises, you know, perhaps chefs that have been out of work that are cooking things up in their backyard. We're quite keen to uh, get that stopped. Um, and uh, yeah, we're also interested in people that might be able to provide some, um, some sponsorship for our campaigns. So um, there's some information if you'd like to get in touch with us and we'd be very pleased to hear from you.
Thank you very much, Lydia. It's great to see the work you're doing and good luck creating an app. It would be a great resource for our communities and getting some important messages out. I'll open up to questions. How can EHOs help the Food Safety Information Council help get food safety messages out to consumers and businesses about being prepared for emergencies like power outages, floods and fires? Yes, yeah, certainly there's lots of information on our website that people can use um, and uh, EHOs do a fabulous job. We, we really appreciate what you do. I don't think we could run a food safety system without you, but uh, there is lots of information. We're actually quite keen to get printed information too so that people can you know, have it you know, stuck to their fridge or somewhere so they know exactly what to do. Uh, but we do appreciate what you guys do, um, particularly in Food Safety Week. People have been doing some lovely work on their social media. So anything you can share on social media, whenever there is uh, power outages, which seem to be practically every day at the moment, uh, we, we post the information on our website. So do follow us on social media and do share that on your social media. And uh, any of those local uh, radio programs you do, it's great too. Thank you. This person's had a chef show up on Facebook Marketplace selling to the masses. What are your most common food safety issues or what cases are of most concern? Yes, certainly um, these Facebook sales are a real concern. We have contacted Facebook and uh, obviously they're not doing anything about it. Um, and, and it's a shame actually because uh, these home chefs uh, think they become master chef, but you know they're just running things out of a home kitchen, which is a real worry. And in some cases, people were cooking up great big curries on their home barbecue and setting them from their backyard, which is a worry. Um, so it, it is our worry that people are starting to sell food, um, but it's also a worry that people can make people, uh, friends and relatives sick uh, with bulk catering. Um, certainly as we open up after COVID and people are going to be partying over the summer, that we know there's a big risk. Uh, food poisoning cases went down during the lockdowns, of course. We're not sure why. A whole range of things. Less testing if people got sick, they may not have gone to the doctor. But also because they're not doing bulk catering, we think they weren't having big um, events out there, and nor are they going out for... Um, to uh, restaurants for very large caterings like you know Mother's Day and so forth. Um, can you tell us any more information about the app? Uh, yes, I've got a whole range of students doing it from one of the Victorians University are working on it. Um, it will draw down off of our website all the key things about food safety and emergencies um, with essential things that people to know as, as well as the basic food safety um, Unlike New Zealand, sadly, we didn't have a nice alliteration of cook, clean, cover, chill. We have cook, clean, cover, separate, I think. Um, and we want to pull on that. And they will be able to um, message us if they are online. But uh, we're quite excited about that. Um, hopefully, we'll see some results early next year. Um, but we might need a little bit more funding to uh, get it live, I think. And it might need a little bit more work there. They're great students there. And what other consumer education campaigns should be a priority for the council? Yes, this is what we'd like some ideas for you. There's a whole load that we do do because they, they link into the calendar. So going back to school lunch boxes, we'll be working on this year. Um, with, we're working very hard on, uh, next year on a hand washing campaign for school children. Uh, quite a large number of kids in a survey didn't actually wash their hands at all at school. So we've worked very closely with um, one of our members that do the glitter bug hand washing with UV light. And we've got a lovely video up on our website if people want to have a look at it uh, with kids from an Adelaide school who were filmed using it. So um, we're very keen on, on doing that because it's such a basic thing, having hand washing out there for a whole range of reasons, not just food safety. I love doing the glitter bug with students. It's great. Uh, my theory is it also picks up uh, kids with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder because they freak out because they can't wash it off their hands. But it's, uh, it also teaches you who you don't want to shake hands with. So. Yes. <laughs> Thank you again for your time, Lydia. Thank you. I'm pleased to introduce another Australian environmental health professional as our next speaker. Josie Rizzo works for the New South Wales Food Authority as and is a senior policy and programs officer in the local government unit. Her local government unit is responsible for the food regulation partnership, which provides support and assistance to council officers that regulate the retail food businesses within their local government areas. 
Hi, Josie. Welcome to the live chat. Oh, hello. Thank you very much for inviting the New South Wales Food Authority to Food Safety Week um, presentations. I'm very happy to be here. Um, the theme you've got going this year is Be Prepared. So um, what I'd like to cover off is what's happening in the retail space in um, New South Wales. So I'll talk a little bit about the compliance in New South Wales. We'll talk a little bit about um, who the agencies are and how we manage food safety in New South Wales. It's a, it's a different model to some other states. And um, some of the key things that we need to be mindful of when EHOs, when we're doing inspections um, in terms of risk-based assessments. So we all know that food safety is really important. Um, we don't want our elderly or young kids in particular becoming sick or anyone. And we've all had a dose of the trots. So it's not pleasant and it can even be life-threatening. So, um, you know, our remit is to stop that. Uh, we have a, a method of, um, a consistent method of assessing businesses for compliance. And if they don't comply, of course, they can receive um, penalty notices and other there's other enforcement tools that we can rely on. For the businesses, it's not a good look to get poor publicity. Um, and we have the Name and Shame website up and running as well and has been for many years now, which uh, the media like to um, trawl through at some stages. And, and you can see in that slide there that they've actually named some businesses, which is really um, not good if you're one of those businesses. And ultimately, the environmental health officer can close down the business, um, issue prohibition orders as required. And similarly, so can the food authority in relation to any, uh, any business type. So I'd just like to um, share with you some of the information in relation to what the food authority does. And um, we were established in 2004, and it's a um, through chain. So from paddock to plate, we're responsible for food in the state. We have a licensing system for the high risk sectors like dairy, meat, seafood, high risk plant products, food service to vulnerable persons and eggs. And we also inspect, we license those. So we conduct audits on those businesses. And we also inspect and audit non-retail businesses like manufacturers and wholesalers. We have an expert, a wide expertise in food safety. We have a um, science group, a, a policy group that uh, contribute to the national um, agenda. Uh, we have um, expertise in um, foodborne incident response and investigation, and also in um, other research programs that we do. We have the name Shane, as I mentioned, and I'll show you that a bit later. And we have a support role for our local councils. And we do that under this, what we call the Food Regulation Partnership. And it is indeed a partnership and it's been in effect since 2008, um, when all councils, 100, well, back then it was 152, but now we have 128 councils were appointed as enforcement agencies under the New South Wales Food Act 2003. And what this arrangement does, it clearly outlines who's responsible for what. So what jurisdiction a particular business lays in. So as I mentioned, councils do retail and basically the food authority does all the rest. Um, now, for us to have a successful partnership, we need to be able to provide support, advice and assistance to EHOs. And we have a dedicated team, the local government unit for which I work for, that provides that service to environmental health officers and to councils. And together, the aim is to reduce foodborne illness. So local councils, they're a huge group of people, over 500 in New South Wales, environmental health officers that for the 128 councils that do over 40,000 hospitality type retail businesses. So that includes restaurants, cafes, takeaway, grocery stores, temporary stores, mobile food vehicles, and home-based businesses, and approximately 60,000 inspections annually. So it's a huge task, and we're really grateful for the work EHOs do, particularly given that 
most of the foodborne outbreaks do occur in the retail space. So we've got a vested interest to work very closely with councils and the retail space. Um, since the appointment of and, and the development of the Food Regulation Partnership back in 2008, at the commencement, we had about 90% compliance in the retail space, and now we're sitting at about 97%. So you can see that it's had a, a really great uh, impact working closely with councils, providing them all the materials they need, training, resources and advice. So we've had a good outcome in the retail business sector. I also want to acknowledge the challenges that councils have faced and all regulatory agencies. We've had two years of unprecedented events like bushfires, flooding, drought, and of course COVID that's um, really created um, or presented a huge challenge for everybody, not just councils, not just the Food Authority, but every person. But um, you can see there the number of councils that have reported to us that they have been impacted by these events. The one on the right, the other, that mainly is attributed to, and you can see there's a big jump this year in the blue as opposed to the previous financial year, and that's attributed to the mouse plague that's going on in central uh, New South Wales that's affected councils as well. So having said that, I just want to acknowledge that it's been a difficult time, but our environmental health officers have been doing a fantastic job. Um, so how do we make sure, and you know, we want to be prepared, that's our thing, but how do we make sure that when we're out there doing our routine food safety inspections, we are providing as much support as we can to businesses. Well, the EHOs do provide education and advice, you know, an educative role is part of their role. And we also look at making sure that we risk, we, we prepare by using a risk-based approach. And to do that, we have, need to have a look at the business type, what activities they're doing, their consumers, who are their consumers, and the size of the operation and determine if they're high, medium and low. And then based on that and their performance, their compliance performance over the you know, few previous inspections, we can determine how often do we need to be there and inspecting them. And of course, if they're making low risk product and there's no issues with um, vulnerable consumers and their performance over the past few inspections have been really fantastic, then we can afford to let that slide a bit longer and see them, um, you know, a longer time between inspections. But certainly if they're making high risk food um, activities like raw egg mayonnaise and stuff like that, which we really don't want them to do, um, we will be there more frequently. We also use a tool called the Food Premises Assessment Report or the FPAR for short, um, so that we can all um, look at the premises in the same fashion. We have a consistent outcome report that can be uh, prepared for the business. So having said that it's a risk-based approach, what are those high-risk ha food handling practices that we know cause foodborne illness as shown by the investigations that our folk have done over the um, many years? So we've got this list here, poor cleaning and sanitising, cross-contamination, poor hand washing, poor temperature and time control, poor pest control, poor skills and knowledge, and improper use of eggs. And eggs was the major cause of our foodborne illnesses due to salmonella in the last few years. But we have made an impact there, and I'll share that with you in a tick. Um, we work together with councils, um, as I mentioned, the food premises assessment report so that we can all be consistent from council to council. Um, if one McDonald's Dubbo and one McDonald's in um, uh, Marrickville would hopefully have a similar report and be gauged against the compliance requirements uh, similarly. We have a Scores on Doors program. Yes, it is voluntary. But the purpose is to make sure that consumers can make an informed choice. They can have a look at what's going on in those premises at that point in time 
and it generally tends to improve business compliance because they're wanting to get the five star and it rewards good practices. We also have the Food Safety Supervisor Program in New South Wales, um, as do most of the eastern, well, the, all the eastern seaboard states, Queensland and Victoria, but ours is um, particularly stringent in that we have um, um, approved training organisations, registered training organisations that um, someone needs to go through before they can receive a food safety certificate. And those approved RTOs, registered training organisations, need to go through several, several hoops and be audited by the Food Authority as well. So it's a very stringent process. Um, I mentioned earlier we have the name and shame website. So any penalty notices against any food business under the Food Act um, is assessed for publication and most um, do land there. And I just wanted to share with you some of the common offences over the last financial year of penalty notices that have been issued. So you can see their unclean premises, improper food storage, poor hand washing facilities, unclean fixtures, fittings and equipment, poor pest control, poor display conditions and poor cleaning and sanitising. Um, so just to see what's out there. Now, some time ago, back in 2015, um, we put out a reducing food, foodborne illness uh, reduction strategy, basically, and we're hoping to we were hoping to reduce food poisoning inc incidents by 30%, and we were doing that from paddock to plate, from improving practices on farm through processing facilities and across through to the retail sector, um, and we know that, as mentioned by other speakers earlier. Salmonella, Campylobacter, Listeria, and fatal anaphylaxis are our key concerns. And we've had over 4.1 million cases, costing a huge amount of cashola. So, how have we been? We went 2015 to 2021. What were our results? Well, I'm very pleased to note that Salmonella type of Miriam dropped by 54% thanks to our salmonella reduction strategy. Oh, so what was our salmonella reduction strategy? And, you know, I really am very proud of this because it worked from paddock to plate where we looked at all the processes and put a big effort in reducing salmonella. And it worked, it, it considered things that had happened on farm during grading, processing and grading, the labelling, we need to make sure everything's labelled correctly and traceable. And in the retail space, it's quite clear that businesses cannot use cracked or dirty eggs. We've had environmental health officers with oh, lots and lots of training we've been doing in that space. Um, the FSS program has got an additional module about raw egg products and the risks associated with that. And there's a lot of consumer information out there as well. Um, so we have really worked hard across the whole chain and just a little bit of a stat here to show you that um, where the blue line in New South Wales and orange line is uh, the Australian numbers, but just up to 2018, circled in red, you can see across the bottom, we had some targeted retail surveys and workshops about raw egg products and the risks associated with those. And EHOs did a fantastic job going out there when they're inspecting businesses and basically saying, this is a high risk. You could be in an awful lot of trouble if this, if you um, poison people. There are alternatives, much safer alternatives. You can buy commercial products, but okay, if you want to do it, you must have it um, reduce its pH to 4.2. You must document that and so forth. have very stringent controls in place. So consequently, a lot of businesses uh, switched to using safer products. And as I mentioned, we've got a targeted FSS module looking at these high risk egg products and you know what you can do to avoid that. There are alternatives. We've put out a raw egg guide um, and made it quite clear that prohibition orders, if the raw egg products are not being made correctly and safely, that a prohibition order is appropriate tool to use by the environmental health officer when they're in that retail space and seeing a big risk. So that's led to, as I mentioned, our 54% reduction. And 
Finally, just before I finish up, just want to share with you that we've got lots of information on our website um, and you can stay connected if you wish by subscribing to alerts. And um, I'll finish off with that and thank the Environmental Health um, Fraternity for um, their efforts. Thank you, Josie. It's great support that you're providing the EHOs in New South Wales Councils and keep up the great work so we can keep reducing the number of foodborne illnesses and the huge financial impacts that it has on the health system and economy. So we're now opening up for questions from the audience. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, the unit that we, we have a dedicated unit of five people and we provide support and assistance to the 500 odd uh, EHOs by conducting networking meetings with them, which we do around the state three times a year. We have 16 groups and we go around there three times a year. Um, so we at those meetings, we provide training on specific topics. It might be the salmonella reduction strategy, it could be Campylobacter, it could be pest control, which we're doing this round. Um, and we also have opportunity for the region, EHOs in that region, to chat about what they're up to, what issues they've found, and to resolve any issues at a local level. Um, we also have representatives from that group that um, sit on a state group meeting called the State Liaison Group and feed back to the whole of New South Wales regions um, and talk about state issues. And we provide, we're at call 20, well, at call five days a week. So if there are any issues that um, EHAs come across, they can pick up the phone, send an email, and we're there to help them. Great. The reduction in cell monosis in New South Wales is very significant. Can you elaborate on how that was achieved in the retail sector? Uh, yes. So um, as I mentioned, we do a lot of training with the, our EHOs and we kicked off a strategy, a salmonella reduction strategy, by making sure that all the EHOs understood the uh, impact of salmonella on businesses, on consumers, and how the salmonella is is um, causing the foodborne illness that we've been seeing. And it was basically due to raw egg use. So um, with that said, we did a huge uh, education campaign. We prepared guidelines um, and guidelines with which provided some teeth so that um, they could actually enforce non-compliance um, and make sure that the practices that were being undertaken were safe and weren't going to cause a foodborne illness outbreak. Um, I hope that answers right. your question. Thank you very much. It was great hearing from you today. Thank you. Vanessa Mann is our next speaker for this live chat. Vanessa is part of the Shellfish Market Access Program, Shellmap, with the Tasmanian Department of Primary Industries. Shellmap works to determine optimal environmental conditions for the harvest of shellfish in Tasmania to reduce risk of illness linked to the shellfish consumption. Thank you very much. Welcome, so, Vanessa. Thank you for taking the time joining us today. It's great to see you again. Thank you, my pleasure. Um, so my presentation today is talking about how we can use environmental science for food safety. And as Melissa mentioned, I'm from the Shellfish Market Access Program with the Tasmanian Department of Primary Industries, Parks, Water and Environment. So what is Shellmap? Um, Shellmap is a Shellfish Market Market Access Program established through a partnership between our Department of Primary Industries and two industries, industry bodies with the purpose of ensuring that Tasmanian shellfish can be consumed safely. Now oysters are a, a high risk food product um, and the reason for that is because we don't gut the animal and fillet it and cook it. Generally we eat the animal whole, digestive tract at all, and we usually eat it raw. So this is what makes it a food that needs careful regulation. So our goal is to minimise the incidences of illness, um, avoid costly food recalls and withdrawals, um, optimise the access to market for shellfish growers and also in doing so, protecting the shellfish industry and the brand in Tasmania. So we operate under a fairly complex legislative framework which starts with FSANS, the Food Standards Code of Australia and New Zealand, 
Standard 4.2.1 sets out food safety and suitability standards for seafood generally, from pre-harvesting production of the seafood up to but not including manufacturing. The Australian Shellfish Quality Assurance Program produces an operations manual which details the practices and procedures um, for management specific to the shellfish industry in Australia. This is basically our operational guidebook. Then we have two pieces of state legislation here in Tasmania that effectively make large tracts of Tazans and the ASCRAP operations manual um, legally enforceable in Tasmania. So ShellMap staff are authorised officers under the Primary Produce Safety Act, which gives us the ability to dictate when growers may and may not harvest their farmed or wild caught shellfish. This is our main role. So a little bit about the industry in Tasmania. Um, it was established in around the 1980s um, and there are 28 growing areas in the state and from a regulate, regulator's perspective, we further divide those into 51 harvest areas. Most of these are export approved, which means that we as regulators have our practices audited by the Federal Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. Um, approximately 3 million dozen oysters are produced in Tasmania annually. Uh, with a value of around $24 million. So it's not the biggest industry in the state, but it certainly is a big part of brand Tasmania. Tasmania has long been thought of as a food bowl um, for premium produce, and seafood is a big part of that. So let's have a look at some of the growing areas. This is Research Bay, which is our southernmost growing area um, and probably one of our most remote. It is surrounded mostly by remnant native forest, there's very little development on the shoreline other than about a dozen shacks and a couple of campgrounds. In the north, we have Anson's Bay, which is a wild harvest area. So shellfish aren't actually farmed here. It's an area for clams and cockles. Um, there is a small town on one shoreline, um, which is mostly full of holiday shacks. There's a large agricultural area to the south. And then on another side, we have the Bay of Fires Conservation Area, which is popular with tourists and walkers. And then we have Malting Bay, which has um, a lot more urban development than some of our other areas. As you can see, there um, is urban development right up to the shoreline on the eastern side of the bay. We have the Georges River, which runs through an agricultural landscape, and the town of St Helens at the mouth of the river has around 2,000 people. There are campsites to the north, um, there are mountain biking trails and bushwalking tracks. So it is a complex catchment to say the least. But as regulators, it's really important that we understand the areas that we're regulating. And the best way to do this is to visit them. So every year we visit all 28 growing areas around the state. We walk the shoreline um, and try and identify potential pollution sources. We do GIS analysis to determine land use um, we look at sewage networks and recreational activities such as boating and camping and we drive around the upper catchment to meet the growers and ask them what they're noticing. What are the potential pollution sources in their waterways? But microbial testing really underpins the basis of our management. So we have set sampling sites in every growing area and we test the waters at these sampling sites after adverse pollution conditions, which are usually heavy rainfall events. Um, and we need to see at what point do the waters have unsafe levels of thermotolerant coliforms or TCs. So the ASQAP manual has a recommended upper limit of 21 CFUs per uh, colony forming units um, per 100 mils and dictates that the last 30 samples taken in a growing area, at least 90% of these must be below the limit. So we take our samples, we give each result a pass fail value and then compare these pass fail values against environmental observations, specifically rainfall, river flow and salinity. So for example, if the salinity is 30 parts per million, what percentage of pass of samples are passing when we test the thermotolerant coliforms? Is it 90%? If not, what is it doing at 31 parts per million or 32 parts per million? We need to find that sweet spot where 90% of samples have an acceptable level of thermotolerant coliforms. And that informs our management triggers. So once we've done the shoreline surveys and spoken to the growers and done all our microbial testing, we can write a management plan. So every growing area in Tasmania has an individual management plan and their environmental triggers 
will be based on geography and hydrology of their areas. So this one is taken from the Cloudy Bay Management Plan um, for 2020. It shows that if the salinity in the lagoon uh, drops below 31 parts per million, then they are not permitted to harvest shellfish for human consumption. Likewise, if they get more than 55 millimetres of rain in seven days at Cape Bruni, they're not allowed to harvest shellfish for, management, uh, for human consumption. So we need to look at, the once the management plan is written, we need to look at the environment every day. So our department, Dipipui, has a water information portal where um, a number of rivers around the state um, have sensors that measures river flow at any given time, 24 hours a day. So there are 12 um, rivers in Tasmania that we have shown directly impact a harvest area, either by flowing into or through or near an area where shellfish are farmed. Um, so, for example, the Swan River, which is this graph here, provides a management trigger for Great Swan Port. And through our microbial testing, we know that if the river flows at greater than 35 cubics, which is cubic metres per second, then the Great Swan Port growing area is likely to have an unsafe or an unacceptable level of TCs. And that's when we determine that the harvest area needs to be closed. So not all areas have a river flow trigger, but they all have a rainfall trigger. Um, so we look at 17 Bureau of Meteorology rain gauges on a daily basis, which is publicly available information. And again, rainfall triggers for every area depend on geography. So some um, harvest areas are fairly quickly impacted by rainfall and they might have a 24 hour trigger. For example, if 17 millimetres of rain falls at Hobart Airport, then um, we close Pipe Clay Lagoon. Um, but others require a bit more of a build up over time and so they might have a three day or a seven day cumulative total of rainfall. And the final piece of our management puzzle is biotoxin testing. So we have a state of the art laboratory here in Tasmania called Analytical Services Tasmania and they run biotoxin tests on shellfish meat for us twice a week. So every growing area must submit an, a, meat, a meat sample, oysters or mussels, depending on what sort of shellfish they're growing. And they are tested for um, the various toxins that shellfish produce. Um, so that is PST, DST and AST. So one makes you sick, one will paralyse you and one will make you forget that it ever happened. Um, we also test waters for phytoplankton because the phytoplankton that are in the water, some of them have been um, connected or linked to the production of these toxins. So once a month, the growers send in water samples for phytoplankton testing and we count, the, the label count how much phytoplankton is actually present in the water at any particular time. So our local health department has these blue signs that um, have been erected around boat ramps mostly, um, warning the general public not to eat wild shellfish. And whenever um, shellfish toxins release or, or phytoplankton levels reach dangerous levels, um, the red version of this sign is flipped um, to further strengthen the message that people should not be um, eating wild caught shellfish. And of course, we close the harvest area at that time. So I've spoken a lot about opening and closing, closing harvest areas, and we do this through an online portal um, where we have a list of all our growing areas and harvest areas. And when we need to change the status to open and close, um, it's a very simple process. We um, click the button, choose the reason, write the day and the time that that um, closure or opening becomes effective um, and we save it. And then that feeds into a classification notice. So this is um, a legal document. Um, it is a living document that so every time status changes, we update it. Um, it is publicly available on our website. Um, and it's really important that growers um, are completely aware of the status of their growing area at any particular time. So in summary, um, Shell Map ensures that Tasmanian shellfish can be enjoyed safely through our shoreline surveys and our understanding of the growing areas, um, through daily and weekly environmental monitoring and through weekly and monthly laboratory testing for phytoplankton, microbial testing and biotoxins. So when you next eat an oyster, you'll now have an understanding of all the things that have gone on behind the scenes to make sure that the shellfish on your plate is safe to eat. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. It's great to learn about the work that is done in the shellfish industry prior to harvesting to ensure this food is safe to consume. I'll now open up for any questions. 
The three environmental variables mentioned are rainfall, river flow and salinity. How is the salinity measured? Um, so the growers are actually responsible for taking their own salinity measurements. They all have a salinity meter which they calibrate and test. They, they use it every time they do a harvest. They're, re they're legally required to actually check that the salinity is at an acceptable level. Um, and they also check their salinities um, if they think that they might be ready to be reopened if their environmental triggers are back down to where they need to be. They can submit their salinity to prove the final piece of the puzzle um, and keep records of that. So that's very much um, a bit of self-regulation by the growers. Yep. And how often do you see conditions requiring you to close a harvest area? Um, it's very much dependent on weather. So when we have um, heavy rain events, we often have to close a number of areas. Um, other things that can cause harvest areas to close are um, adverse events in a catchment such as a boat sinking where we need to test if perhaps there's been a fuel leak or if there's been um, a septic tank foul in a local shack in the nearby village. Um, we test for E. coli and the shellfish before the harvest area is allowed to harvest again. So um, it's it's very much a daily, a daily thing. Great. Thank you again for your presentation, Vanessa. It was great hearing from you. Thank you. Our next presenter is Edmore Masaka. Edmore is a lecturer in the Occupational and Environmental Health and Safety Unit at Edith Cowan University, where he is the Environmental Health Discipline Lead. He has worked for over 30 years in the environmental health, occupation, health and safety and occupational hygiene fields. Welcome, Edmore. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to welcome everyone to to this uh, event, um, to the Food Safety Week. Um, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, a topic which is uh, not usually thought of or discussed uh, when we are dealing with food safety. And uh, as uh, environmental health officers, these are areas that sometimes uh, we do not usually come across. So what I'm going to do is um, just run you through in the next few minutes um, on this topic. And um, I'm just going to, to, to start by, by discussing what, uh, what we mean by um, Food Safety Week. Uh, so the first, the first definition that we need to understand is what is meant by uh, antimicrobial resistance, which we are looking at at the moment. Sometimes you come across the term anti bacterial resistance. Um, antimicrobial resistance is an encompassing definition, which includes um, the process whereby the microorganisms that we are usually concerned with um, are able to adapt and grow uh, in the presence of uh, what we call antimicrobial agents that can be drugs. So you can be antibacterial, that is the ones that are targeted at uh, killing or destroying uh, bacteria, then antivirals, <clears throat> obviously those target viruses, antiparasitic and um, antifungal. So what it means is that um, we have uh, enjoyed so much success in terms of uh, treating uh, different infections because um, a number of antibiotics have been um, developed over the years. But the trend has been that quite a number of that antibiotics, of those antibiotics are becoming sort of ineffective against a number of microorganisms. Antimicrobial resistance is a natural occurrence. From time immemorial, microorganisms or such as bacteria have got a tendency to, to develop some resistance to antibacterials or antimicrobials. Some of them are naturally occurring. But what has happened is um, over the years, the number of uh, new antimicrobial uh, microbials that are coming into the system is becoming fewer and fewer. But at the same time, the number of microorganisms that are developing resistance um, is, also, is also increasing. So what we have is there are a number of impacts that we need to, to think about. If you just think about um, if you get injured or maybe if someone 
eats contaminated food, maybe food contaminated with salmonella typhi murium, and then a person falls sick and uh, they go to the hospital. If they try and uh, just imagine about this is an imaginary situation. If uh, the bacteria has become resistant to what we call the drug of choice or the first line uh, treatment, it means that people are going to die. And uh, you can just imagine that things that we don't think that they will be able to, to kill us, such as maybe just a wound. Um, if we, something is not done about uh, uh, trying to prevent or stop um, the de development of uh, antimicrobial resistance, it means that people will end up dying from uh, uh, very, very simple, simple injuries. And uh, the impact, as I said, is that uh, antimicrobial resistance is impacting negatively. On, uh, on public health. So it is a significant public health challenge at the moment um, because the number of antimicrobials are not becoming less effective against um, different types of uh, microorganisms. And uh, that leaves us with very limited uh, treatment options. Because remember what I said is that the development at the moment of new um, antimicrobials has slowed down compared to the rate at which antimicrobial resistance is increasing. And uh, obviously, it means that um, it becomes ineffective to treat um, illnesses uh, that are caused by these microorganisms. And obviously, people might actually tend up to end up uh, visiting the hospital for treatment more frequently, or they end up staying in hospital for longer periods of time. And that actually increases costs, right? So there are a number of drivers um, that we need to be aware of. Um, these are things that think these are aspects that we say uh, can can cause uh, antimicrobial resistance, and um, this is in addition to the naturally occurring uh, antimicrobial resistance mechanisms, as I mentioned earlier that you've got some that are natural or caring. Um, but in this particular case, we are mainly we are we're going, we're going to be discussing about um, the man-made ones, um, man-made man anti, sorry, sorry, we are discussing about the man-made drivers. So according to the World Health Organization, there, as you can see, they've identified this. We have got what is called over-prescribing of, anti of antibiotics or antimicrobials, you might want to call them. Then uh, where people prescribe a medication to treat people, we're talking about um, antimicrobials, uh, drugs, where they are not really necessary or they give too much. And uh, you also have patients who do not finish their course uh, of um, antibiotics. Then uh, our main focus, obviously, in terms of food safety, it is the overuse of antibiotics in livestock and fish farming, because they are used for different reasons. They are used to treat um, uh, diseases in animals, uh, in food animals, and also fish. Sometimes or they are used as prophylaxis. That is uh, as a preventive system to prevent uh, these food animals from um, um, getting infected. And are also, they are used for uh, to promote growth, which is uh, an area of concern at the moment. So you tend to have sometimes indiscriminate or overuse of uh, antibiotics. Then we have got poor infection control, obviously, in uh, hospitals and clinics, and lack of hygiene and poor sanitation. And this doesn't necessarily mean that... Um, it happens in hospitals. This can actually happen in food prep areas themselves, where sometimes people are not um, effectively using um, sanitizing or sanitizers agents. Maybe they do not uh, use the right concentration. And what basically happens is you end up having bacteria becoming resistant to that. Then uh, there's also, as I mentioned, lack of um, um, or lack of new antibiotics or the development of new antibiotics coming into the market. Then uh, if we look um, at the next slide, here I, I'm just going to be discussing um, some of the mechanisms. What sort of causes, uh, uh, how does this happen 
what are the mechanisms in which antimicrobial resistance happens? Of course, this is a long discussion. I'm just going to briefly run through. There are basically a number, about four of them. Uh, as you can see in that image there, there's what is called conjugation. So you have a bacterial cell, and we know that the bacterial cell, inside the bacterial cell, you have the genetic material. And um, what will happen is uh, sometimes the bacteria will actually be able to produce or to in inject, as you can see, uh, conjugation on panel A there, uh, it will be able to transfer, it It develops this uh, mechanism, this structure that actually joins with the neighboring bacterial cell. And uh, through that process, it is able to transfer its DNA um, through a multi-step process of just requiring cell-to-cell -cell conduct. So you only, you only need to have uh, one cell next to the other one for this to actually happen. So if um, the bacterial cell in um, panel A there under conjugation, if it has got um, the actual uh, what we call resistome or the actual property in the DNA, that uh, gives us the, the ability to become resistant to the antimicrobial, it will be able to actually transfer that to a neighboring cell. That is one, one way. Then the other one is a transformation, which is panel B in the image. And in transformation, we are basically saying that sometimes what happens is when a bacterial cell lysis or it breaks up, it will release the internal contents within itself uh, into the surrounding environment. And um, that can include free DNA. So what will actually end up having, happening is uh, that DNA can actually find its way into the cell. So that cell which was not uh, resistant will be able to gain resistant properties from the free DNA. And then um, you also have the special transduction, which you can see in panel C. Normally in this particular case, the key player here is what are called bacteriophage. A bacteriophage is essentially a virus that attacks other bacteria. And um, these bacteriophages, they are used in food for different for in food production for example for different purposes but uh, we also know that uh, they can actually infect bacteria and um, what happens is uh, these uh, bacterial fetches will be able to transfer uh, the bacterial DNA from the from the host cell because what happens is when a virus attacks a bacterial cell it will actually take over the DNA it introduces its DNA. So it actually it, it takes over the DNA and then uh, it commands the bacterial cells DNA to start multiplying more of uh, itself. And um, in that process, it will be able now, when it attacks another cell, um, as you can see in the image there, the middle one, the bacterial phage now will actually inject the DNA um, Uh, sorry, the, the DNA component, which is resistant to the antimicrobial uh, that is that that was present in the other cell. So that is what happens with transduction. And uh, and uh, the same thing. The other one is called specialized transduction, which is a bit uh, a bit different. But you know, they may transfer that from a previous infected donor cell. But uh, with transduction, as I said, they will be able to inject it into another cell. So those are the process. And uh, when you look at uh, the next uh, slide, uh, where we are going to be, where I'm just explaining some of the pathways um, of, um, uh, micro, of antimicrobial, I'm saying how does, in terms of the food chain and in terms of food safety, this antibiotic use follows different transmission uh, routes um, which makes the situation even worse. So what you have is you have uh, the use of, of medicine or what we call for therapeutics use for treatments in hospitals or in the community. And then you also have uh, animal production as you can see animal husbandry or plant or aquaculture. Sometimes we are using antibiotics in, that particular, in those particular areas. So you can see there, the top one, the one on the left, human activities and the other one where you've got uh, the animals and the plants there. So what basically happens, this is called direct conduct, where you have um, um, people sometimes eating meat, which is uh, which has got uh, antimicrobial resi residuals. 
and um, or eating food which has got antimicrobial residuals. And during that process, that can actually transfer antimicrobial resistance. And uh, then um, at the bottom there, you have, as I say, some people after using antimicrobials, obviously people will, will release waste in terms of urine and feces, which is containing antimicrobial residuals. And uh, that actually goes into the environment. And the same thing with uh, animal production as well and plant production. That will also go into the, into the environment. So you actually have this circulation of um, um, antimicrobial residuals in the environment. And uh, this is one of, uh, so these are just a few examples of uh, the transmission routes for antibiotic resistance into the food chain. How does it get into the food chain? You can then in the next slide, I'm just going to sort of um, now discuss uh, some of the antimicrobial bacteria that are associated with foodborne illnesses. I've, I've been listening to some of the presentation where we know that salmonella has been a big issue. Uh, in Australia and Campylobacter, obviously, these are the some of the two. I think these are the two leading causes of foodborne illness, uh, not only in Australia but worldwide. And um, resistance has already been determined in um, some of these uh, microorganisms. And E. coli, obviously, is the other one uh, where resistance has already been uh, determined. And uh, the, the Enterococcus species, there are a number of species that fall under that group, as well as Shigella. I'm sure we are all familiar that uh, these are food, sorry, these are microorganisms that can cause, cause foodborne um, illnesses. So this is actually, these microorganisms, if, if some of these microorganisms have been able to develop resistance to, to, to antimicrobials. And it is quite a concerning a concerning issue. And in the next slide, um, I just decided to show you, to just to give you a few examples of, um, of uh, a few examples of uh, the type of microorganism and type of food stuff uh, from which microorganism antimicrobial resistance has been determined. So you can see there in the east in the EU. Um, in 2014, they managed to pick up um, MDR stands for multi-drug resistant Salmonella infantis, and um, with a prevalence of about 70%, greater than 70%, and also in broiler meat. So you can see MDR, multi-drug resistant E. coli, which is quite a concern. Then in Norway, as you can see there, again, broiler, broiler meat, broiler, they managed to isolate uh, that uh, to, 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 to yeah, what we call ESBL producing E. coli and vancomycin resistant uh, enterococci uh, species uh, with those prevalence on the right. Then uh, in the US, obviously, you have turkey, you have chicken, ground beef. In China, you have pigs. And in Egypt, you have meat and dairy. So you can actually see that um, when we talk about food safety, antimicrobial resistance is already impacting on that in one way or another. It is almost like uh, the climate change scenario where sometimes people don't sort of realize that there's something big which is happening, what I know, want to call the elephant in the room. So we can actually see that um, uh, quite a number of food poisoning microorganisms are developing antimicrobial resistance. And that is bad news for food safety going forward. Then uh, you can move to the next slide. I just want to, discuss this is taken from the usa because in terms of data we do not have a lot of data here in australia um i took this is from the usa this is all about salmonella foodborne illness in the usa between that period there 2009 to 2011 as you can see they had 1.2 million illnesses of uh, this salmonellosis which is the non-typhodia the one normal associated with food poisoning 1.2 million cases and um of that 1.2 million cases, 100,000 um, were, and, were, and, were antimicrobial resistant foodborne salmonellosis. 100,000 cases. And of that 100,000, 36,000 cases were resistant to these two drugs there, ceftri, ceftriaxone, <laughs> difficult to pronounce, and ciprofloxacin. These are usually what we call your, your drug of choice or the first line drug. So you had 36,000 being resistant 
to that other safe tree axon and 33,000 being resistant to cipro fluoxacin. So you can see now the impact in terms of um, food safety. Uh, it is quite um, concerning. <clears throat> and now if we want to come to the Australian scenario, the next slide um, will actually give us um, information in Australia. So there is what is called the Australian Commission on Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Um, they, they actually produce this information. And uh, we are saying that critical antimicrobial resistance reported in Australia. This is as at August 2020, um, last year. So you've got species and then critical resistance. So you can see enterobacterial, um, they, were, they, they were resistant to, 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 to that, uh, to those, uh, what do you call it, uh, and to that, those antimicrobials on the right. Um, and the Salmonella species, I just put that in red, which is, um, I've mentioned, okay, this is in Australia. The previous slide I was talking about the USA. So in Australia, they've already picked up um, antimicrobial resistant Salmonella, and it's resistant to this safe triaxone, um, which is uh, the first choice for treating uh, this type of non-typhoidal salmonellosis. Then um, Shigella species, they have also managed to identify multi-drug resistance in Shigella species. Then Staphylococcus aureus uh, complex, uh, resistant to vancomycin. And this is quite a big issue um, in the number of microbials, as you can see there. So we can see that antimicrobial resistance is already happening in Australia, and it's already impacting on food safety in one way or another. Then um, you can move uh, to the next slide. So this one here, I just decided to, to show this one here. Um, again, taken from that report produced by the ACSQHC. So you can see that enterobacter in New South, those enterobacterials in New South Wales were discovered. That is, these are the actual outbreaks associated with uh, antimicrobial resistance in, in, those, um, in those pathogens there. Then uh, E. coli, uh, we also had um, um, this one here was supposed, I think, I think this was, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I'm sure this was some type, I think this was enterobac, en, enterococci in, uh, in South Australia. Then you also have uh, in, in Victoria and Shigella, in, uh, I think that was in uh, New South Wales. So you can see that it is already happening uh, in Australia. And uh, what makes it a bit more concerning is um, looking at uh, the incidence of uh, food poisoning cases in Australia. It's a bit concerning because we are tending to have uh, the food poisoning microorganisms for which anti antimicrobial resistance has been determined, dominating in terms of uh, cases, as you can see in the next slide. Yes, as you can see in the next slide here, I just took this, uh, this as you can see, you can see Campylobacteriosis and, um, and, uh, and the crypto, so and Salmonellosis there, um, they are quite, they are leading in terms of um, a gastrointestinal infection. This is, these are mainly foodborne, illnesses. So it is quite concerning that uh, we might be on the brink of uh, <laughs> significant antimicrobial resistance. And then the next slide. In the next slide, I am. I just decided to say, where do we go from now? It's, it's fair and fine. We talk about, my, it, we have already put the fact quite clearly that uh, antimicrobial resistance is already happening in Australia. So the question is where to now? Because in most cases, sometimes uh, this is not something that we normally deal with. I know that sometimes as environmental health officers, people go out there, we do our inspections. In most cases, we are looking at uh, different processes. I know that in terms of food safety assurance, we are looking at uh, paddock to, to, to play it. Uh, we are talking about uh, um, putting in place effective uh, measures to ensure food safety from production right up to, to through manufacturing, right up to, to consumption. But then the question is, where, how effective is it? So we know that uh, antimicrobial resistance, it doesn't respect any geographic boundaries. We do import food from outside 
And um, if they don't have effective controls there, it basically means that we can easily introduce antimicrobial resistant um, strains of food poisoning um, or food food foodborne um, or food poisoning uh, agents into into Australia. And uh, we know that food on animals are usually the key reservoirs for this anti anti antibiotic resistant as far as food safety is concerned. And we have already indicated that there is indiscriminate use of antibiotics in agriculture, not so much in the developed world, but in the developing countries um, where they do not have effective programs. But as I said, because of globalization and the need also to actually import food into the country, you run the risk of actually introducing these uh, antimicrobial resistant microorganisms. And um, in the next slide, um yes uh and in the next slide here i just said okay this is the the the, the way to go where we are talking about uh about uh, what is called the one health approach to controlling antimicrobial resistance in food chain it is uh something i think we started a few years ago but it hasn't gained so much traction in, in australia what it does it focuses on identifying and addressing what you call the risks to health that arise from the interface or the relatedness, interrelatedness between the human health, animal health, and ecosystem. So in food safety, we know that we produce animals for food. And um, we need to have that cooperation between uh, people responsible for regulating animal production from veterinarians to the farmers themselves, to the growers themselves, then in the food manufacturing industry, and also in the retail sector and uh, consumer safety section and um, things like environmental health. So we need to actually have these people come together uh, through this, what is called the One Health approach. So we need that uh, integration. So I think that just brings me to the end of uh, this uh, presentation. Maybe we can have questions. Thank you, Edmore, for your interesting presentation on antibiotics and their effects on the food we consume. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions? Oh, we have one question. Um, why should environmental health profession be worried about the impact of antimicrobial resistance on food safety? Um, thank you, yes. Uh, what happens is, uh, as environmental health officers, we go out there and we conduct inspections. And I said, I gave you that example about uh, uh, how antimicrobial resistance is transferred from one bacterial cell to another. So what we have is people are not cleaning um, the food preparation surfaces properly. That can actually increase that. And uh, what you end up happening is, what might end up happening is uh, you might end up have, having a lot of food poisoning outbreaks uh, which cannot be treated. Um, and that can have a significant impact on uh, on uh, human health. Okay, because our role, is to, our, our role is to our role is to our role is to to ensure food safety. Thank you, Edmore. We really appreciate you joining us. Okay, no, that's all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final speaker today is Sandra Vale. Sandra is the National Allergy Strategy Manager, working across the National Allergy Strategy projects. She has a background in public health nutrition with experience in project implementation, training and assessment. She is also a final year PhD student at the University of Western Australia, undertaking research in a public health approach to implementing the ASCIA guidelines for infant feeding and allergy prevention. Welcome Sandra, it's great to have you with us. Hi, and thank you for um, having me. So I'm just going to talk to you about um, some of the resources and work of the National Allergy Strategy. For those of you who don't know what the National Allergy Strategy is, um, it's an overarching framework for a national response to the rise in allergic diseases, including long term as well as short term, uh, short to medium term objectives. Um, the National Allergy Strategy is actually a partnership between um, the Australasian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy, or ASCIA, and Allergy and Anaphylaxis Australia, which are the peak medical and patient support organisations in Australia. Um, we are consumer focused and all of our resources are developed in consultation with key stakeholders. 
So food allergy in Australia, is it a problem? Um, it's become um, a significant problem and um, Australia is actually referred to as the allergy capital of the world. We uh, currently have a situation where one in 10 babies have a confirmed um, food allergy. We have around one in 20 children um, aged up to five years of age um, with a food allergy and uh, one to two um, adults um, in 50 have a food allergy. So we're starting to see um, the prevalence in adults increasing as many children are not outgrowing um, some of their allergies and carrying them into their teens and adult years. In terms of um, the common food allergens in Australia, um, these are the, the most common, um, but it is important to note that um, a person can be allergic to any um, food. So while we see 90% of allergic reactions caused by these foods, um, you know, a person can be allergic to bananas or peaches or mushrooms. It's not just the common food allergens. If we look at anaphylaxis causes by age, so anaphylaxis is the most severe form of allergic reaction. Um, and if you look at um, anaphylaxis by age and where the the solid black column is um, reactions to food you can see that um, as um, people get older um, reactions to food um, are less but they're still one of the leading causes of anaphylaxis so except for the um, 30 plus years um, where it's not quite as high as um, some other um, causes, um, food-related anaphylaxis is, um, is a significant issue for most people. Um, and I will just also note that some of these unspecified cases could in fact be um, food-related. The other thing that's really important to know is that small amounts are a big problem. And when we look at what the lowest observed effect, adverse effect levels are, um, so this is the lowest um, or the smallest amount um, of protein that a person um, would react to. You can see that um, less than a teaspoon of egg, less than one thousandth of a peanut, um, or a very, very small amount of um, milk can actually cause um, a, a, an allergic reaction and even a severe allergic reaction um, in, in a person. So um, touching or smelling the allergen um, doesn't usually cause um, anaphylaxis, um, but um, cooking um, fish and, um, and shellfish um, it does cause the allergen to aerosolize, and so some people can have um, mild to moderate allergic reactions just from being around fish or shellfish being cooked. So, what are some of the things that we've um, that uh, the National Allergy Strategy has done um, to try and engage with food, particularly the food service sector? So, our um, philosophy is that it's a shared responsibility. Managing food allergens in food service is a shared responsibility. Consumers have a responsibility. They must declare their allergy every time they consume food, whether they're eating out at um, a restaurant, a cafe, taking, getting takeaway food, um, they must declare their food allergy. Um, food service providers obviously have a responsibility because they're providing the food, so they need to know how to effectively manage food allergens in their um, food preparation, but also understand how to read labels and identify which foods are appropriate for someone with food allergy. And of course, authorised officers, EHOs and legislators also have a role. Um, our legislation covers a lot of areas of food allergen management, but not everything. Um, and it's important that um, EHOs and other authorised officers going into food premises understand food allergen management themselves to make sure that they can provide good advice and guidance to, um, to businesses. So we've developed some training for people who work in food service, uh, whether they own the business, whether they're front of house or back of house, we've created training that is available free of charge 
um, and it's online and they can get a certificate of completion on um, successfully completing the final quiz. So there's all about allergens, which has been updated this year and is targeting um, all um, general food service businesses, particularly those that are like chain restaurants where you've got lots of quite young employees and lots of transient staff. Um, and so this course has been designed to be for front and back of house staff and takes about 45 minutes to complete. We've created um, a standalone course for cooks and chefs. So it's got a bit more detailed information around selecting appropriate foods and preparing appropriate foods. We've also completed, uh, sorry, created courses for um, people working in hospitals. Um, a lot of people with allergies think that because they're in a hospital that they're safe and that the food that they're going to be provided with is safe for them. But we actually know that that's not the case. Um, so these courses were created um, to help um, those not only working in kitchens in hospitals but also those providing the meals on the ward um, with appropriate um, education about how to provide safe food. And also this year we have created two new courses, um, uh, a course for people working in school canteens or tuck shops um, and also in boarding schools and um, staff and upper school students doing um, food technology and also for children's education and care, um, whether it's um, long day care, family day care, um, occasional care or even vacation care or outside school hours care. And then finally, a course for um, those who work in, in camps. Um, and we're currently working on a course that will help people working in aged care, mental health facilities and uh, correctional facilities as well. So along with the training, we've also created a um, All About Allergens resource hub. And you can see across the top here that we have um, um, uh, sort of sector specific uh, resources. Um, and I'm just going to go through the general food service ones, but we generally have created um, a suite of resources for each of those different sectors to help support them. So there's a free downloadable booklet, um, a um, checklist, um, some bookmarks, which I'll come back to in a moment, um, the food allergen ingredient substitution tool. So if someone has an allergy to peanut, for example, what are some alternative ingredients that can be used? Um, so that's what this tool is about. Um, and also, um, if you're substituting an ingredient, you know, what other allergens do you maybe need to think about as well? Um, a food allergen menu, menu matrix template, which we strongly recommend that businesses use, and a standardised recipe template, uh, which we also strongly recommend that businesses use. Um, it's surprising to, to hear how many businesses do not have uh, their recipes written down and are not using standardised recipes, which makes it very difficult to manage food allergens and to know what's in your food so then you can inform your customers. So um, we also have a food allergy policy template and a um, food allergy and food intolerance um, management audit tool. So this is so businesses can actually look at the processes that they have in place and, um, and I guess assess them against what is considered best practice and see if, um, if they have effective processes in place. Um, we have an animation and sample templates, um, a downloadable template and a sample um, template as well for how to complete a food allergen menu matrix to make it easy. We also have um, several templates and samples um, of the standardised recipes um, template and um, a specific um, section about the ingredient substitution tool as well. We also have a specific animation about buffet style service as we know that this is high risk for anybody with a food allergy um, and it's important that um, food businesses understand those risks and take measures to try and reduce the risk. 
To help educate consumers, we've created a food allergy aware website. Um, and it, this is also to help educate health professionals who um, obviously um, diagnose patients and provide advice and um, education. Um, and for environmental health officers and other authorised officers, we've created a resource hub specifically for you. And this resource hub has just recently been updated. So this um, content has only gone live last week. And it really is a resource hub. It's there um, to guide you to relevant existing um, information around how to um, manage food allergens in um, food service um, and in the community. So um, we hope that you'll access this resource, um, which we've put together for you. With the bookmarks, these are available free of charge. So um, you can order them free of charge. There's no postage costs. And um, you can provide these to businesses when you go out to visit um, and, um, and do your audits. There's a lot of people that have contributed to this work. Um, those that work within the National Allergy Strategy, um, our volunteer project co-leads, and working group members and also our stakeholders which review um, content and we have received funding from the Australian Government Department of Health to be able to create these resources as well. And there's my contact details and the website links if you would like them. Thank you, Sandra. Allergens are certainly an important food safety topic that everyone should familiarise themselves with to ensure food is provided safely. And the resource hub for EHOs looks really interesting and great to promote through our networks. We're now opening for questions for Sandra. What can EHOs do to help businesses to manage food allergies better? So I think an EHO has a really important role in providing education to businesses. So um, I think if um, what we know is that there's very little information in uh, current audit tools and inspection audits um, around food allergen management. And if we're not asking the questions of um, food businesses about how they manage food allergies, then that one, they may not be aware that they do actually have a legal responsibility to manage them, but two, they may also not see it as important. So I think an EHO just uh, even asking the question of, you know, what do you do to manage food allergens um, or what information or processes do you have in place to be able to provide information to customers um, will make them realise that this is actually something that they need to manage and, um, and uh, give it some level of importance. What happens if someone has an allergic reaction to a food when eating out? So we always encourage people to report an allergic reaction to a food, which would then require a... Um, an investigation by an environmental health officer. And that's really important because um, unless um, those investigations are conducted, we won't know what's happened and we can't keep other people in the community safe. So reporting the reaction um, will allow that business to be informed that, you know, there's um, a, an allergic reaction has occurred and the investigation will see whether appropriate practices are in place or not. And if they're not, they can be corrected so that other um, food allergic people are kept safe. Right, thank you. Do you think the legislation needs to change to put a duty on environmental health to audit menus and labels? I think we, we need to have um, a nationally standardised um, audit tool that means that every business um, is actually assessed for their, um, their um, processes and practices around food allergen management, and we currently don't have that. Um, I think that, um, you know, we have some states where there are food safety supervisors. I think we need to have nationally um, food service businesses need to have food safety supervisors and then a requirement of those food safety supervisors is that they must do food allergen management training because at the moment no 
you know, a, a, a person running a food business does not have to undertake any food allergen management training. So I think if we come at it from those three perspectives, um, then I, I think, you know, we'll see improvement. I think education really is important um, and um, and hopefully we can get that education happening through um, some level of, of mandate or legislation, um, but, you know, moving people along rather than waving a stick. Great. Thank you so much, Sandra, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. So that concludes our Food Safety Week live chat this year. I hope everyone enjoyed this event as much as I did. I want to take this opportunity to again thank all of our fantastic speakers for taking the time to be part of today's live chat and to share their knowledge and experience with everyone. A recording of this chat will be made available via the EHA YouTube channel in the coming weeks, so keep an eye on the EHA social media channels for the announcement. Lastly, if you would like more information on environmental health EHOs or EHA, visit the Environmental Health Australia website by following the link on the screen. Thank you.